So, so the, the last uh, part of our uh, conference is a uh, dis discussion panel. The panelists are the chairman of the presentation sessions. So I'd like to introduce you. I hope that you may be somehow inspired by some of the presentations or some discussions outside. And um, the panel will be moderated by Mario Cervantes from OECD. Mario is a senior economist, uh, in, particular, in particular he is responsible for the working party of innovation and technology policy, which brings together policy makers from 34 member countries as well as the BRICS to develop better public policies for science and technology. With 20 years experience in science and innovation policy, Mario has helped national governments and agencies develop and assess policies concerning issues such as planning, licensing, and universities, tax credits for business R and D, open innovation and globalization. Current activities include work on open science, public private partnership in STI, and transitioning large social technological systems on more suitable paths. And uh, I would only like uh, to ask us to be strict on timing because some of the travel arrangements later in the world will be taken after. Thank you very much and, um, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you also to the Polish organizers for bringing us here today. Um, we have a very distinguished panel. They've been introduced already, but I would just uh, remind you we've got uh, Professor Nicholas Kenny on my left. Professor Stefan Harman on my left as well, and on my right, uh, Professor John Walensky and uh, Cameron Daniel. So we've had a very um, today's agenda was around opening science for global challenges, and we heard a lot about um, what is um, open science, what are the different elements, including the role of open access. Um, in the breakout sessions, we also had some very concrete. Uh, presentations on institutional approaches to implement some of the roadblocks, some of the technical uh, issues that have to be resolved, the skills. So it seems that after the Berlin Declaration, uh, are we at a dream, still at a dream, reaching further out for this distant fruit, or are we closer to reality? So maybe I can start with that question for our, our panelists and just tell us, are we still at a, a dreaming? So I, I hope we're still dreaming, um, because I think that's part of the human condition must always hopefully be to look at somewhere beyond where we are, otherwise the point of scholarship seems, seems to be lost. Um, are we still dreaming about you know, full access um, to the product, products of, of scholarship, public scholarship in particular? Yes. You know, we're not there yet. Um, are we getting closer? Yes. Are we getting there fast enough? No. Um, are we in a position where there are lots of things we should be doing that we're not? Also, yes. And I think that the question becomes one of what are the balances? What can we do today? Um, what do we need to lay the ground for uh, for the future? And how do we choose where there are resources or energies? Require where we, when we choose to focus our attention. Um, I don't actually disagree with Stephen at all that you know, the, the initial focus, one of the most effective things we can do right now, um, is strong institutional mandates um, for getting material into the hospital. You know, that's one of the things that we can, we can really move on and make rapid progress. Um, where I guess we disagree is I think there are other things we can be doing that will also be positive and that don't need to detract from that. Um, and that there are risks with focusing exclusively on that. Um, but you know, in broad terms, are these things important? Yes, absolutely. Um, and we need to keep our eye on the far future so that we can track our path through the through the complicated landscape that we're trying to navigate towards a better world, hopefully, on a day by day basis. I would just uh, briefly add. Um, well, I think actually today stands as evidence that there are many, many adventures going on. And in, in light of Cameron's uh, remark and the dichotomy he says with 
uh, Stephen, that, that um, I think it will take many, many ventures, and I think it, it, the range of initiatives and the different levels at which they're working, uh, from archives to data uh, curation to uh, top-down, bottom-up, uh, all of those things are, are necessary to mobilize awareness and attention. Everyone shares from publishers to scholarly associations to faculty members. Um, and we have, as I say, numerous initiatives underway. So it is that um, in technology they talk about the final mile, well, in, in American terms at least, uh, the idea that the most expensive aspect in terms of laying cable or pipe or anything else is, the, is that final segment, uh, getting that coordinated and connected. And, and I think we still face that challenge. Um, but I was very encouraged by everything I saw today uh, that we have the will and, and the energy, if not yet a single uh, vision for it. Uh, yes, um, to say what impressed me is the um, debate on open science, which was uh, kind of a, something new to me, the notion of citizen science. I was very impressed by what you're doing here in Poland. I was particularly impressed by what was happening in Finland. And I would say in both of these instances, you were probably ahead of the majority of other European countries. Uh, but uh, so, uh, and in that sense, uh, I think we have grounds to be optimistic. Uh, the, the, the tension between dream and reality, uh, it is going to become real that we are going to have open access as soon as institutional repositories, which now, generally speaking, are existing across Europe, are being rapidly brought into being. As soon as there is mandatory compliance, then I think there is, there is going to be open science or open access within Europe itself. Uh, the issue that I am unhappy with is uh, those like Cameron who s imply or suggest or state that there is a pool of money out there that is going to meet all of the costs. I have never been convinced about this pool of money. I've heard this spoken about a lot in the UK. You calculate the total cost that the universities are paying for contributing to journals and suddenly that's not going to be charged anymore. All journals are going to be free as soon as you have open access. That is the bit that I have never found uh, satisfactory at all. That is the bit that has to be addressed. If you are going to have open access, indeed even you, if you're going to have gold open access, uh, which my neighbor on the left doesn't want to see occurring. Uh, Burn? I didn't want to see it happen first. Is, yeah, but, but if, if that does become the model, uh, then the theory of that is that the subscription charges are going to uh, drop very rapidly, 20 and 30 percent a year, until they're practically at vanishing point. I I've never seen that, that, that model worked out in practice. So in that sense, the, first of all, is there a pool? And secondly, is there a mechanism for making that money available? Because there are going to be real charges in a uh, particular when we have open access to data, uh, establishing repositories, maintaining repositories, etc., etc., there are going to be charges. So. Me? Um, I think nobody doubts that open access is optimal for research and also inevitable. But nobody should doubt the fact that if and when it arrives, and it will, it's not going to be early because it's already too late for it to arrive early. It's not going to be prompt. What I, my answer to this, to this dream question is, the only thing that's relevant is what people do, not what they dream. Uh, it's evident what they should do. What they're suffering from is not an excess of dreams, but a, a condition that I call Zeno's paralysis. It's related to Zeno's paradox. Zeno was a philosopher who said, I can never get across the room because before I get to the other side, I have to get halfway to the other side, and that takes time. And before I can get halfway, I have to get halfway halfway, and that takes time. So basically, I can't even get started. Well, that's what all these repositories that you're worried about who's going to pay for, they're all up. They're all empty. Yeah. Their problem isn't that there's not somebody to pay for the repository. The repository is being used for other purposes, but it's empty. What needs to be done is to take that first step, which is to go across the room with a green, gratis open... Oh, and one last thing. Poland, I do admire 
Poland. Uh, not for all of this talk about open science, which is dreams, but for that last talk that we had over here where uh, young scholars uh, and, and jurists were working out the various alternatives to approach their administration with a green open access mandate. Thank you. So a lot of um, roadblocks uh, on, on the way to realizing this dream. You talked about money, you talked about um, um, infrastructure. Um, maybe turn the question here a bit is we talked a lot about uh, implementing open access for the use of the scientist, a, a bit for this community at large, but we haven't talked about that much about business and how we get um, the pool side of this equation going? How do we get some of the demand that could maybe help us in terms of developing the right models for, for pricing uh, for access? So what should be the, the role of business and how can we get them more involved? I'm not just talking about the, the, the publishing industry, but you know, the developers are going to help build the infrastructure, the small companies that are providing services to the open access community. Yes, there's, there's two, there's at least two broad classes of business we need to be, need to be concerned about. One is, and we've kind of touched on this at a couple of, couple of points, the small and medium enterprise, and you know, I, I will reflexively refer to John Horton and Alice Wan's Denmark study and, and other studies where they show that there's a, a significant, that, you know, again, when we talk about pots of money, the, the cost of, um, the estimated cost of lack of access to small and medium enterprises in Denmark was in fact less than the cost of taking Denmark unilaterally open access. Um, so this is why I keep coming back to this point, that there's, there's actually, there's, a, there's, there's enough money in the system to do this if we choose, if we have the mechanisms, and I take Nicholas's point, it's, it's not enough to say there's money there, we have to figure out how to transfer it from one place to another, and then we have to ask the question about what we need for the future. Um, but we know that, we certainly know that that SMEs uh, are interested in research and not just not just those that are directly involved in research but that the example from the, the Horton study I particularly like was a company that um, was making pipe lagging so insulation for, for, for water pipes and um, they brought, created this new lagging material uh, which they spent millions as a new product taking out to various places and putting it in. And then they discovered that the material only lasted 18 months in situ, a fact that was known in the research literature. So that company lost an awful lot of money having to rip out millions um, of euros worth of, of pipe lagging. And there are many you know, companies, I have a personal experience of someone who runs a, you might call a virtual biotech. Um, I got a phone call one day from a person who said, I have this problem. Um, I have a problem that relates to making a medical device safe and I think you might have a solution for that problem. I thought, well, how did, where, where did you get my contact details from? He said, well, there's this paper in PLOS One you wrote. I think that's, and I found it in Google and I could look at the paper and, and decide whether you were the person I wanted to follow up with. And have I told you what that is? No, I haven't. I haven't told you what the product he was interested in making it making was, um, because he's still pursuing this work and looking at patenting it. So there's a there's a commercial aspect to that that that, that open access can also support. And then of course there's the the big industry, um, the pharmaceutical industry, the engineering industry, um, and we know that they both use research on a large scale, and that at the moment many of those big companies contribute to the cost of, of research publishing. Um, and therein lies an interesting question, because if we, do, we move, if we move to an open access space, and that contribution may be taken out of the system. And it's, it's not overall, it's a relatively small proportion, maybe 5 10% of the total, total publishing revenues. But in some disciplines, like chemistry, um, it can be quite a high percentage. Um, so I think we need to ask some questions with those industries that are particularly engaged with the research community, how we can build shared infrastructures. There may well be places for public-private partnerships for infrastructure and systems where together we can contribute to um, the systems that will help address uh, the sustainability issues and the systems we need um, for the future. So there's both the pull from small industries and innovators and entrepreneurs but also I think the potential to do really interesting things that will drive academic and industrial engagement um, for the future 
by building shared communications infrastructures. Okay. Chalma, you're at Stanford. How do you see this in that burgeoning Silicon Valley with all these startups? What's, what's their take on open access? Um, actually, I'm a bad representative of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the other side of that because I develop open source software for publishing and, uh, <laughs> and haven't gone the commercial route, Mario. Um, I mean, uh, certainly uh, Stanford stands on its reputation as, as uh, spinning off uh, much in terms of industry, but, uh, but on a patent and on a fairly closed uh, basis. I would point from my side as, as the alternate, the counter Stanford uh, perspective um, that uh, at the industry or the business of, of health and, and particularly public health. Uh, and I think yeah, you were there yesterday and when I talked about a study we're doing with doctors to see if they're using, if we gave them free access to the complete library at Stanford, would they use uh, that access or would they be too busy or would they not be interested in the research? And we're uh, three quarters of the way into that year that we're providing it for them. And we're finding that doctors every seven to 10 days are picking up a research article uh, for use in their clinical practice. We're going to start interviewing them about their use. But the key for us is that if you open it, they will use it. Um, I can't put a price on how this is driving down health costs, but I can imagine that if a doctor is taking his or her time, um, presumably unbillable time, uh, in terms of health care, uh, and they're using that information, it may save a life or two, and for me that pretty well represents an infinite uh, value uh, in terms of, of opening the research. So I think we need more studies. Ours is a fairly small, 400 public health and doctors are participating in it. We're finding the public health officials, officials who are very concerned about the health of their communities, uh, health of, of interest groups, patient groups, for example, uh, are using the research much more frequently, two or three times a week. They're going into uh, the primary research in PubMed and other sources. So there is um, a way of building uh, the evidence that it has a, a greater public impact um, and that it will continue, continue to contribute to professional education, drive down those costs, will con continue to contribute to the quality of care that people get. Uh, and I think it will, in a way, support um, both taxpayers and businesses, philanthropically minded businesses, uh, to increase their support for research and for open access. Thanks. I think that's important because if we want to make the case for open access, open science, it can't just be the case for the scientific community. It's got to be one for society at large. Do you think that um, embargoes would be a problem in terms of getting the professionals and companies? Yes, Mario. Thank you for asking me that question. Uh, Mario, I'm <laughs> I, my straight man here on the side. Yeah, so, we, so we found with doctors, um, we looked at the date, the one-year embargo that is becoming very common um, and, and often longer for the social sciences and humanities, which I find very degrading. But at any rate, uh, the physicians we're using are currently using 35 to 40 percent, excuse me, 35 to 40 percent of the research that they're using is within 12 months of its publication, which means that it would fall under the embargo and they would not have it. So imagine uh, tearing, if you like, every third paper out of a doctor's hands and saying, you can't look at that uh, for another 10 to 12 or whatever it is, months. Um, so it is, uh, I think we need to understand the possibility of public use of these documents. And I think we're going to see that, that politicians and funding agencies are going to begin to change their policies uh, on the basis of the value that it creates, including the, the currency of that research. Thank you. Nick, what's your take? My principal understanding of the interest of industry, big industry, is that wherever they're located, they like to have universities that provide well-trained engineers, people with PhDs in physics, biochemistry, chemistry, uh, pharmacology, uh, because they want to have a cohort of well-trained people that they might employ, um, employ in their industry. So, you know, and they are willing to give some payback to the universities, or at least I've seen it in my experience, and that they will have they are agreeable to fund some PhD programs in conjunction with the industry themselves. But where that occurs, uh, they, are, they want to have closed information, closed data. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if there is going to be open data, which won't be done within, uh, within the, on the floor of industry itself, they are very interested in, in open data repositories. 
because they believe that that will be beneficial to themselves. Now, as a non-scientist, I, I don't know how they are going to make immediate use of it, but I would say the pharmaceutical industry particularly would be interested in having access to open data. Do you see some tension there between intellectual property and, and uh, open access? See, they're, they're very concerned about intellectual property uh, where they sponsor and fund <coughs> industry themselves, research themselves, where they take on PhDs who work for projects which they define, then they want that to be closed data, but they would be interested in the other data uh, being open. Okay. Stephen? No, <laughs> But this is one of the actually that takes us to the next issue around, uh, I think somebody in one of the sessions said we should get rid of the copyright altogether. Is that somewhere? I heard somewhere. Um, <laughs> and yet, we, we look at the experiences that were presented from the countries and the universities, it seems that people are working with the existing uh, situation. So is it really black and white? Or do we need special, some, I think it was Stephen said, you said we, we have copyright for different disciplines, or for one, we have a one size fits all, but the problem is that we need, we have different requirements across disciplines. Uh, is, is this just uh, wishful thinking? I mean, or is it, is this something we can, you think will, will come to, will come, will become reality one day? I, I should probably own up to that comment because it was mine, um, and it was meant flippantly. Um, so I should probably explain what I mean by it. Um, my experience has been that mostly copyright um, legal constraints create problems. Um, that, that's been my experience. It tells me things that I'm not allowed to do. So Christoph gave a, a, a great presentation both yesterday and, and a similar one today. Rich showed, he showed just what open air does, what one of our um, repository infrastructure does. And he showed all the different exclusive rights that need to be negotiated for each thing that open air does. And, and that those things might be different in every single country in the world. Um, the, the complications can be, can, can create a barrier, create friction. Um, now, so when I said that, uh, what I was really saying was I wish, those, I wish those restrictions would go away and we could just get on and do things, that we didn't have to worry about that. Um, that is a pipe dream. Uh, copyright reform is politically a non-starter. Re I mean, serious copyright reform is a, is a non-starter. Um, in the foreseeable future, um, as is I think, patent reform. So there are many things we can think about doing effectively using the existing copyright framework um, to effectively enable people to do things if we think purposefully about that. Um, and we don't need, in many cases, it shouldn't really be a fight. It should be it's a technical thing, it's an interoperability thing. We don't, as a publisher, we don't ask the authors whether we should provide XML or whether we should put things in an index or whether we should make the metadata of the bibliography available so that people can discover and find it. Um, and it seems to me in, is that licensing as a tool is, is actually a relatively similar thing. It's just a way of making sure that all the things we create work well together. And we can do that in the current framework. Um, it would be nice not to have to, but I appreciate we live in a world which has the realities of Justin Bieber and, and Margaret Atwood also having to make a living with what they do in their different economic frameworks. John, what do you stand on this issue? I mean, do you think um, license, creative common licenses, this different arrangements are sufficient? Do you think we, we actually need stronger exemptions from fair use? Uh, I, I, th I think, um, and again, I would compliment Christoph and his uh, presentation because he did lay out some of the alternatives between uh, a kind of bottom-up creative commons or a top-down uh, reform of copyright. Uh, I think we, in the United States we're seeing uh, executive action, in fact. Uh, Obama recently um, put into an appropriations bill uh, a, a, a requirement, a, a mandate, uh, following Stephen's example, a mandate uh, that all federally funded research, not just in health now, but in all areas, over $100 million, where over $100 million is spent on research. Um, there is still a 12-month embargo, um, but it's now a requirement that that work be made available within 12 months of publication. And so that is a form of copyright reform. Uh, it, it, it now creates a further exception. Um, what I was taken by, Christoph, in your presentation is that 
These reforms by exception are not what we want. What we want is a, a, a categorical distinction. It's not an exception that research should be available. Uh, it is a human right, I think you said, uh, and I applaud that. Um, and so, but, but each of these steps will make it that much easier to pull them together. Everything from fair dealing and fair use to the funding requirements from federal governments uh, to the movement among faculty members to, to embrace uh, the Creative Commons license. The Creative Commons license is, is voluntary. Uh, it is uh, not yet a standard that, that everyone, I mean, entire journals and entire publishers are using it. Um, but it's still, again, that my earlier point that we, it's a series of fragmented um, implementations that we, I think, still need to strive for a, a large, more universal and widely accepted or Could I address universal that? solution. Yes, Stephen. Please. Yeah. Uh, this time I have a bid. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this isn't far from reality. I think if you read publishers' minds, they would say the battle is more or less lost. And in order to hold out as long as possible, we need a 12-month embargo. With a 12-month embargo, we'll get enough money to send our grandchildren to college, and then who cares what happens to their grandchildren. A 12-month embargo. They would like to embargo open access for 12 months, and, and Obama's directive plays right into that. It's a, simply a directive that after 12 months you have to make it open access. But the publishers have already conceded that 12 months is enough to, to hold on to their turf for long enough to put their grandchildren through college. That's the one to beat. And Obama can easily beat it in a legal, in a, without a, 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 exceptions or anything else. All he has to do is add to the Obama directive that within 12 months you have to make an open access but you have to deposit Im immediately upon acceptance. With that, all of the dominoes will fall, and it's as simple as that. If you don't, if you play into the embargo and you let play the embargo game, it's going to be years and years and years still. Nick, do you want to weigh in? Uh, <clears throat> Personally speaking, I would have no problem. I'm speaking now as a publishing scholar, I would have no problem with uh, copyright being abolished. Because copyright has never served, in my experience, the most dangerous period. In the interlude between when you give a paper at a conference and when you expose your ideas to the public and when the paper is published, which might be 18 months later. Uh, in my very first experience of a published paper, I gave a paper at a, at, in, at a small seminar in the United States at a major university. I submitted the article, it was accepted to a journal, and then there was somebody in the audience much older than I who made the mistake of submitting much the same article to the same journal, and happily mine was accepted before. But quite clearly the ideas that I had were taken directly from that paper. He cited some of the evidence that I had cited, he cited some new evidence, but the ideas were the same. He subsequently published it in a less prestigious journal, so therefore I saw precisely what he was doing. Uh, but in that sense, copyright doesn't preserve your ideas, and that's the most valuable part of all. But once a paper is in print, you know that th from that point forward, if anybody wants to use it or cite it, they have to make a reference to you. So as long as that is there, then you are covered. But there is this critical period between the, when you divulge your ideas and the interlude between publishing, and copyright has never preserved that. I, I agree with you, but, uh, but you, I think you've left out an Im important implication of what you just said. Well, I, I agree. Well, you, said, you said, and it's true, that the date of publication is completely uncertain. I mean, you could write that could be a, a year, a year and a half. It, it has no relation to the calendar of the journal. That's another thing which makes a joke out of embargoes. I mean, if the delay between acceptance and publication can be a year and a half, then you're actually getting an embargo of two and a half years if you add the embargo after the acceptance date. So, yet another nail in the coffin, deposit immediately upon acceptance. Once it's a deposited, just one person actually has to ask for a copy, and they've already got a record of the fact that you had priority. Yeah. So it's accepted by the journal, and it's already deposited in the repository. And Nicholas, let's be clear with the audience that, that copyright does not apply to ideas. Yeah, it, 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 that copyright applies to the expression of those ideas. Yeah. Uh, and so it was never intended. In fact, 
Uh, one of the nice things about copyright, and one of the reasons I don't want to jettison it just now, Cameron, uh, is that it makes a lovely distinction that the ideas belong to us all. Uh, and it, again, this raises interesting questions about data and other sor sorts of, uh, um, other sources, excuse me. Um, but it is that exact expression. So it is uh, at that intersection of, of plagiarism uh, and exact expression versus um, the more broader sense that we're sharing a common pool of ideas that all of us can draw. Ask a lawyer, ask a lawyer about exact expression. <laughs> Uh, right. we'll, be, I mean, we'll, be, we'll be here camera. all day. I think, I think this also raises a really interesting question, um, this notion of, of being scooped and, and timing and choice of publication that cuts across some of the things around data and other things that we've been talking about and, and the point Stephen raised around people wanting to hold on to data um, and that it there, therefore being different. That we have moved into a space where this question of um, of priority and establishing priority for your ownership ownership or association with your ideas um, can now take many different forms and can have a really substantial uh, record which can be validated and checked. So the notion that there was a video with a timestamp of that talk at that conference suddenly becomes you know, an important piece of evidence. Um, and th it's really important to note that the culture of what, uh, what you get priority for um, is very different. So if I just take the story again, I'm, I'm cribbing from Michael Nielsen a lot today, but the story that Michael Nielsen tells of as a biologist sitting with a, with a physicist, a high energy physicist, and the biologist says, I don't understand how you can put your papers into archive pre-publication because what if someone takes that and publishes that work in a peer-reviewed journal? And the physicist sits there and thinks for a little while and says, I don't understand how you cannot put your papers in the archive, because what if someone comes and takes your ideas and publishes them in a peer-reviewed journal? <laughs> because for the physicists, the priority date is absolutely the date it goes live on the archive. For biologists, we're still concerned about maybe the date of submission to the journal, but primarily the date of publication. And we need to recognise those cultures of priority and attribution, um, and they are also entirely separate. These are, these are scholarly traditions which we need to preserve. And it always concerns me when we talk about licensing and copyright, that actually we run the risk of not preserving them. We run the list risk of using legalistic instruments and the requirements to go to court to protect things that should be the preserve of the community of scholars to make decisions about how we attribute and what we care about and what matters in terms of putting an idea down and claiming it. Okay. I'd like to get the, sorry. Before we leave yeah. the copyright issue, <laughs> might have one. Uh, the one area that I am anxious about is the area of reuse. Um, a good number of my papers through my life, and we're talking about papers now rather than books, but a good number of the journal articles have, have been reused but always with permission. So somebody, I mean, I've done papers in various aspects of migration, and people do regularly do anthology volumes about migration. And, but they've always written me a note and said, could I reprint the paper that you had in such and such a journal? And I don't think I've ever said no. But I would be very unhappy if I woke up tomorrow morning and saw a paper that I had written published in a journal that nobody had approached me about at all, and maybe with a collection of essays that I would consider second rate or something like that. You know, and, and, that, and, and reuse, which we are now giving away under the open access mandate, effectively means that a person doesn't need in any courtesy to come to you at all. And they can even take a part of your paper and reprint it. That's my understanding. If you'd hate that, you'd really hate a remix. Tell me what a remix is. They take your text and they Jungle it around, yeah. 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 Just like TJ's here. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask, the, give the floor to the audience, but before that, maybe I'd like to just ask the panel if they can give us um, uh, their views on where the priority should be for, uh, for governments and for institutions. Where do you think the priority should be? I mean, we've had lots of guidelines. We've had funding for, for open access, for infrastructure. Where do you see the priority moving now? Um, for institutions, and this may surprise you, um, deposit, immediate deposit mandates um, for staff um, to place, place at, at a minimum in, in institutional repositories. Um, for funders um, to provide um, money 
through grants that is available for people to take an open access publishing route if they so choose, um, but with pretty strict conditions on what's expected of the service that funders are prepared to pay for. Um, and for governments to, to talk about and, and start to focus the incentives for all of the players um, to move them gradually and start to change the culture towards one of, of, of focused and intelligent sharing um, of all the outputs of research. Yeah, I, I would just uh, affirm that, to, at least, the, and certainly the, uh, the mandate to, to uh, deposit immediately. Okay, Stephen, the priorities for government funding agencies or institutions, where should the priority be now? We've had, as I said, um, the declarations, the guidelines, funding instruments, pilot of open data going on at the EU level. Um, to get to this reality, I need to say it again. <laughs> I, 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 the number one priority, why don't you narrow it down to? Obama's directive with an immediate deposit uh, uh, requirement. Yeah, uh, well, uh, the point that I, if the point, one of the principal points I had this morning is the need for a European-wide debate on the issue uh, because of the disparity of affluence within European society. The, the, uh, when I was speaking this morning, I was speaking about European Research Council. We are very pro-open access. But I would say the single issue that takes up most time when we meet in plenary session five times a year is the issue of the disparity of the distribution of ERC grants. A relatively small number of countries, three or four, get something like 80% of the grants. And uh, uh, we realize that we are exposed politically to that and that we, any time that we are invited by a country that doesn't perform well to try and go and send a delegation and explain how they might do better, we always respond to that by sending a delegation. And we always give them advice that they must concentrate on the starter grant to try and get a small number of your early stage researchers up to the level where plausibly they might succeed. But if you introduce an open access policy, gold, whereby they cannot afford to get their publications into open access journals, and that was acknowledged by the Springer intervention today, where many Polish researchers have difficulty with the fee, and if you move from Poland to Romania to Bulgaria, they can't meet the cost at all, because you're talking about 2,200 euros per publication. That means that we are freezing those countries out forever at the possibility of their early stage researchers will get a possibility of getting into the high uh, citation journal. So I think since it is the European Commission that effectively under Horizon 2020 have laid down the mandate that you have to conform to open access, I think it is the responsibility of the European Commission to have a conversation about that critical issue of the distribution of cost. Yes, I think there is that risk of a, a new divide on open science, open access. Yeah. Um, could, I, no, could, yes. I, could, I, yes. could we run that by again? The European mandate and the American mandate is for open access. It's not for gold open access. Why is this gold open access option even being discussed as a financial constraint on researchers? Fund them for doing research and let them self-archive. It cost, doesn't cost a penny. Well, now, the, only last week in, in Ireland, uh, I encountered two young researchers who had published. Uh, we were addressing this question of, of paying gold. And uh, they, were, they are considering putting, up, putting in an application for a European Research Council grant. And therefore, they wanted to get their citations up. And they were publishing in a British uh, cancer journal, uh, which, was, which charged them 2,600 euros each to get their articles up there. They considered that was a worthwhile investment in order to, they believed, or were persuaded, that publishing gold is going to get their citation level up at a quicker pace than if they left it in an embargo period when people, uh, only the people who read the, the, the journal itself would see that's, it. That's, it might not, be that's not what happens in an embargo period if you have the button. Yeah. So the button is the cure and not a bunch of money to pay for gold. <laughs> okay, I think we've got some time for questions from the audience, so I'd like to 
Christoph in the back there, you want to get a mic? Thank you. Well, first of all, I feel extremely honored to uh, that that I, I think at least three people from the panel mentioned my uh, name. Uh, three three three. Three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I hope just somebody recorded the <laughs> quotations. But uh, uh, so, uh, but, but secondly, I think it's remarkable that the same person, uh, almost on the same breath, said that she uh, that you wouldn't mind uh, abolishing copyright completely and then you just said that you would like to be consulted if somebody That's wants to, yeah. to reuse your uh, so I, I think it's it's really uh, it, it shows that it's not the that the abolishing of copyright is the proper solution and uh, the, uh, the, the the third point I want to make is that uh, I once gave a presentation titled Does Science Need Copyright? And my uh, answer that I was trying to defend in that uh, presentation is not that uh, it's not, uh, the solution is not with uh, not necessarily abolishing copyright. It's actually not, not needed, uh, not necessary to abolish copyright. But uh, what we really have problem with is the scope of exclusivity which is currently associated with, with copyrights. Um, meaning that uh, that's why I said that it's a wrong approach that we talk about science or research as an exception to copyright. If as long as it's structured as an exception, we will have problem because exceptions in law are always interpreted narrowly. We cannot do more than it's, uh, we cannot uh, um, make the exceptions wider by, for example, analogy. Uh, so. Um, I think the solution to the a, a solution to the problem is that uh, not abolishing of copyright, but a copyright reform that would restructure the way we think about how copyright is affected by uh, by uh, research. Um, and also, there are plenty of ways that we could implement open access without uh, touching copyright uh, at all. Uh, through the use of uh, Creative Commons licenses uh, uh, for, for, uh, as, a, as, as one solution, or uh, open mandates that accompany, uh, uh, accompany public uh, grants. Uh, and these mandates should be really well crafted. And I really listened uh, carefully to, you, to your presentation, where all these points should be really included specifically in the grant agreements not just some roughly defined, generally defined open access, but specifically point by point uh, enumerated what has to be done by the beneficiary. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the floor wants to comment or ask questions to the panelists? It's your last chance to take advantage of this imminent panel here. I come from India, original, and I can see the you know the big importance. Not you know, especially for poor countries and developing countries, it's a huge change. You know, people who have till now very no access to all these kind of information. For them, it is you know either you know you are shutting the doors on them if you have if you don't have open access. So there is a big kind of moral question for the scientific community on the whole to think about you know why is open access important. And I think you know from my meetings with all the people I have met. They are all supporting open access because they can see the benefit to everybody, you know, not just you know one university or one organization, but you know to the whole global humanity. Anybody want to react on this in the panel? Cameron. So it's it's a so John didn't go back to the monasteries, um, which is a shame because I've heard the bit when he talks about the monasteries and it's really interesting. Um, but I think the, it, we have to actually ask ourselves a very serious question. What right, and I, you know, I came from this world um, until very recently, what right do I have to sit in a publicly funded institution doing stuff that I'm interested in without really much responsibility to anyone? Um, what is it about that institution that justifies me having this nice, stable job that, that allows me to do things? What is it that I give up in return for that? What is the, what is the contract we have with society as a whole, what are universities for? And are they for different things in different places? Um, so I think, I really do strongly feel we need to 
as you know, institutions are in crisis, higher education institutions in many places are in crisis, our funding um, for research um, is under pressure and you know, it's under pressure for the core of the research activity, let alone all this other stuff we're trying to add on top of it. Um, we need to take a good, long, hard look at ourselves and have a good, long, hard conversation with the community, with our communities within Europe, or more broadly, um, with the disparities of income and revenue, with the disparities of language, and figure out what it is we're here for. Um, and I think if we don't do that, then we're going to lose the argument for continued funding of scholarship from the public purse. And that, to my mind, would be a shame. Just, uh, I think it's a very good point to raise, because I don't think the, the notion of equity has come up all that much today. So I, I appreciate you raising the global equity issue. And I would just very briefly say that it is a point of celebration and still concern that one thing that has changed uh, radically in terms of open access is access in the developing world. Uh, and it's, it works both ways. The, the journals of the developing world are now present, and uh, if I can do my Stanford Google uh, appreciation, the Google Scholar has changed the playing field in a way that the Canadian company Thompson and ISI has not. Uh, and so we're seeing uh, journals from the developing world are now present in, in, in our searches. And on the other side, uh, the work of organizations like INASP and Research for Life are making that work uh, available much more widely, so that the University of Ghana and Legon, a place I've been, uh, now has 20-odd thousand journals uh, when it had a dozen perhaps before. The, the, India is an interesting case. The, the uh, Research for Life is not available there uh, because of the uh, income level and, and because of the universities, 10% of the universities have very good libraries. So there's still a lot of equity issues. Um, but I think we need to keep that, and, and again, I appreciate that, we need to keep the question on the table, that there is a global equity opportunity for researchers and for universities, and that we haven't participated in the past, uh, and that we now have an opportunity to take a stand on in the present. Thanks. I, th I think that's also going to require more than just policies, though, because I think we've got to develop the infrastructure still in many developing countries. I mean, the machines, the, the databases, the algorithms that you need to operate a more open science. Um, anybody else want to comment on equity with, with the emerging developing countries? I mean, who's going to pay, pay for this? Yeah, um, the, only, the only experience that I ever had with this uh, up front was uh, I had been involved in a five-volume series, Oxford History of the British Empire. And after the five volumes were published, the Oxford University Press brought the editors together to say, what we are, are we going to do now? Now, some of us said, we're, not, we're going to do our, something else now. But the press wanted to make more money out of it, and they wanted to have kind of spin-off volumes. But then somebody came up with the idea, well, why don't we do a special cheaper edition on cheaper paper which will be sold only in certainly India was one of the areas that they had involved because India had a tradition of doing a cheaper quality editions and cheaper quality paper to bring the price down so it would be affordable to at least some people in India. The press didn't want to hear about that. The press wanted spin-off volumes. They wanted all of the volumes in India in the five volumes to be brought together in a single volume, and that you would self-flog that as, as the volume about India. But you know, at least the idea was there. But uh, open access would certainly resolve that problem if the potential readers had access to the infrastructure, you say. Any other questions from, we've got about five minutes from, yes, Lucas. Uh, I have a question uh, about the relation uh, between opening the content and uh, a potential possible uh, change of metrics. You mentioned citations, uh, which are um, possibly a thing of the past and of the present, but, but not necessarily of the future. And uh, I was wondering if, if opening of the content uh, that you uh, uh, discussed is in any, will in any way influence the change of metrics, or perhaps it, it is a completely different, separate story? Uh. I'd be willing to have a go at that. Go ahead. Yeah. I don't know what you mean by opening the content, but if you're talking about open access, uh, if you make the articles 
uh, the journal articles freely accessible online, Google Scholar will not just haul in all of the references, it'll calculate the citations and it'll also interlink them for you and uh, the, uh, out of the, those kinds of uh, metrics you can develop at least a dozen further metrics download metrics, co-citation metrics, uh, rise and fall decay metrics for, for, uh, for citations as well as for downloads, endogamy and exogamy metrics, meaning how inciting and outciting, all of those metrics are potentially available if the <coughs> corpus is open access. If it's not, it's going to be in the hands of Thompson ISI, which has not developed a new metric in 20 years. Uh, I was very encouraged by Cameron's point about, you know, what you can count as a potential metric. And uh, I would think at the ERC level, that's one of the positive things that we have done in that it is, it, it, we, we don't calculate just the quantitative metrics. That somebody who is making a grant application has an opportunity of writing a paragraph about how the research they have done to date has had impact. And it is really up to them to identify what the metrics are by which that impact can be measured. And it's not necessarily just citation alone. So that matters of the kind that Cameron has identified it could, be ident it could be addressed to the person as a way in which they have reached a public out there. So we, uh, maybe it's time to introduce Latin America. So we, We've been working in Latin America for a number of years, and Latin America is at 90% open access for journals published on that continent. Uh, and we're now going to do a study on, uh, to have a pop-up um, appear on each journal article with one question on it, uh, and, and we'll have a number of questions distributed, to ask about how much public use is there? What happens when you make it all available? Uh, government agencies, educational institutions, professional practice, and we'll begin to look then um, at both the uh, responses to the surveys along with the alternative metrics that we're building into in cooperation with journal groups like Cielo and Ray Delic in, in Latin America to see the relationship between public use and tweeting, uh, public use and Facebook likes, downloads, and to begin to understand um, not just alternative metrics but public usage metrics. Uh, and, and I mean, I think part of the the case with open access, we've gone through the moral arguments and we've gone through all of the, uh, now we're going through the historical ones in my case, um, but we still need an evidence base. We still need to think about uh, evidence. In fact, Mary, I think this was one of your questions about evidence-based policy. Um, and so we can begin to understand the impact and to look at regions like Latin America where there was never a question when they went digital about whether it would be open access or not. Uh, and part of that, Part of our interest there is the global impact that Latin America now has because of the extent of open access that they've engaged in. I'm not, I'm not sure policy can wait for all the evidence, so that's a problem. Things are moving very quickly. It's never enough. <laughs> it's never, I mean, I think one of the most exciting things is, is that we now have opportunities to, to cre at least ca gather more data. And whether there's a challenge in turning some of that data into evidence, and there's certainly mm. a challenge in turning it into, into wisdom. But one of the things that open access does very clearly do um, is that it encourages people who are talking about some piece of research to at least link to it, which makes it easier to find that conversation, which makes it easier to understand who it is that's talking about it. Um, I, I keep coming back to Twitter. Twitter's one of my, my favourite sources of information, and it, the reason it is is precisely because you can understand the communities that are talking about research. You, know, the, you can bring evidence that crisis centres are talking about this particular paper, that nurses are talking about this particular piece of public health. So we're getting there, but we need to be serious and coming back to what was the point you made, made it about um, Thomson Reuters, we need to ensure that we do not pass that data about usage over into private hands and that we retain that data in the hands of the research community so that we can continue to use it, so that we can continue to refine and revise the ways in which we turn that raw data into valuable information about the use and impact of research. Because if we lose control of that again, we're going to be back here in 20 years complaining about the next Thomson Reuters and how they develop another impact factor and how that's having a pernicious effect on the way we conduct research. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, you've got an agenda written out for us now, more on, on this issue of uh, evidence and, but also experimentation. I was very impressed in, during the breakout session, some of the initiatives going on at institutions. So. 
both on measurement and, and infrastructure. Um, I'd like to maybe we're short of time. Any last questions or any last points that some of the panelists want to make before we close? Because we've had a full day, um, very rich discussions. I'd like to then ask you to give a hand to our panelists and thank them for their full day contributions. To our chair. And to our chair.